I would like to recognize the new Heterodox Academy chapter here at Cornell, as well as our co-host that you'll be hearing from here in just a few minutes, the Cornell Free Speech Alliance. The addition of these two groups to your campus community shows that Cornell is a place where students and faculty can engage in free and open inquiry and expression without fear of being shamed or intimidated into silence, and you should be very proud of that. The resolution being debated tonight is one of the most hotly contested topics of our time, and that resolution is climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we invite all of our audience members, uh, both those with us in person, and by the way, the 1,200 or so people who are watching live from all over the country tonight, we um, invite you to respond uh, with your views on this resolution, you should have um, received a text or email when you signed up for this event, and this is for the people in the room and those watching um, online. So you can vote on this resolution, yes, no, or maybe, <clears throat> or undecided, yes, no, or undecided. And then we will take uh, another poll after the debate is over to see if your opinions have changed. So please be sure you're voting now bef before the debate begins. We will um, be displaying the poll up here, I believe, um, in just a minute so you can actually see um, how the polling is changing um, as you are voting. So before we begin this evening's debate, I would like to tell you just a little bit more about Steamboat Institute and our Campus Liberty Tour debates and why, who we are and why we do this. We started this debate series in April of 2018 with a debate tour featuring Nigel Farage, the architect of the, the Brexit movement, and Vicente Fox, who of course was former president of Mexico. They were debating nationalism versus globalism. We visited four campuses in five days, including two universities University of Colorado campuses, the University of Maryland, and Lafayette College. The Maryland debate was actually televised live on C-SPAN. It's still there. It's received hundreds of thousands of views. If you want to see a really entertaining debate that was robust but civilized, just a perfect example of what a good debate should be, I strongly encourage you to watch that one. Some of our previous debates, just to give you an idea of what we do, uh, we had Jason Riley from the Wall Street Journal and Donna Brazil, of course, former head of the Democratic National Committee, debate social justice and identity politics at CU Boulder. We've had Dr. Art Laffer and Leslie Marshall, a Democrat strategist, uh, debating the wealth tax and higher income tax rates at Middle Tennessee State University. We've had professors Alan Dershowitz and Amy Wax discussing campus free speech at Pepperdine. And another one that was a favorite was Charles Payne and Bakari Sellers debating free enterprise versus government safety net programs at the University of Texas in Austin. Now you can watch any of these previous debates we've hosted um, in their entirety on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel. It's all there for free, so I, I encourage you to uh, take advantage of that. Our next debate, will, after this one, will be held on April 13th at the University of Colorado in Boulder. The topic will be immigration policy and border control. Should be a great debate. If you can't make it to Boulder for this one, you can sign up for our private viewing link. Uh, go to steamboatinstitute.org. That should be available in just a few days. You can participate from anywhere in the country, so you can watch that link. You can submit your questions during the live event and vote in the pre- and post-debate polls. You can also organize a watch party. Uh, this is something new we started doing last fall on your campus or community. If you want to organize a watch party to watch one of our debates, you sign up at steamboatinstitute.org. We'll send you a free box of Steamboat Institute swag uh, to distribute at your watch party and hopefully make it a lot of fun. Um, we're also planning a full schedule of Campus Liberty Tour debates for the 2023-24 academic year on campuses all over America. Right now, we're trying to sort through all the different requests we have because we're just overwhelmed with requests, which is a fantastic fantastic uh, challenge to have. So please follow Steamboat Institute on social media so you can uh, get all the, the news on these things uh, as, as it is released. Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates are gaining in popularity and importance because of the increasing threat posed by cancel culture, as Professor Wayne mentioned earlier. Now, while cancel culture has become pervasive on college campuses and in society generally, we take the opposite approach. 
encouraging free and robust debate of even the most contentious issues. Our emphasis is always on teaching students and all who attend how to think, not what to think. You're always welcome at a Steamboat Institute debate, regardless of your opinion on the issue being debated, regardless of your political ideology, as long as you're willing to engage in civilized debate and discourse with respect for differing points of view. In planning our series of debates on climate change and energy policy, which began last year, we found it very difficult to find climate experts willing to debate um, Dr. Stephen Coonan. So I would just like to say, uh, we applaud both Dr. Coonan and, and Dr. Sokolow for participating in this debate tonight. It takes courage to get on the debate stage. How many of you would want to do it? Um, so let's, let's think about that and, and give them our respect tonight. Steamboat Institute will continue to give both sides of critical issues a fair and balanced platform to make their case. Because folks, we can't maintain our democratic republic without citizens and leaders who are capable of critical thinking and civilized debate and discourse. As a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, Steamboat Institute depends on the support of many generous, generous individuals, businesses, and foundations to bring you these thought-provoking programs. Um, I would like to say a special thank you to just a few of those. The Adolf Coors Foundation um, supports our Campus Liberty Tour debate program. I would like to give special thanks to them. And also to a couple of Cornell alumni, Pete and Marilyn Coors are also sponsoring tonight's debate and we're very appreciative of their support. I would also like to thank the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the Anschutz Foundation, and the Snyder Foundation for their generous support of Steamboat Institute's programs. I would also like to recognize the many organizations, not by name, don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all their names, but the logos that have been displayed up here as you were walking in and sitting down. There are many organizations uh, around the country that support that support free speech and civilized debate and bringing these programs to college campuses. So please uh, notice those logos. We'll probably have them up again later. Uh, but it really shows a broad array of support from across the country. And that is proof of the sea change that we are observing that's happening on college campuses all over America. Cancel culture is being replaced by challenge culture, free and open inquiry and debate, challenging Students, especially students, you should never be afraid to, to challenge ideas and, and to engage in robust debate. Finally, very quickly, uh, and then I want you to hear from the Cornell Free Speech Alliance before we introduce our debaters. In addition to our Campus Liberty Tour debates, Steamboat Institute also hosts our annual Freedom Conference in Colorado in August. If you're between the ages of 20 and 30, listen to this because we offer scholarships to come out to Colorado for this amazing event. Um, uh, you can find more information about that, steamboatinstitute.org. We'll be opening the scholarship application for the Freedom Conference scholarships in early April. So uh, we have lots of opportunities for young leaders, young journalists that we support. And now, before I introduce our debaters, I want you to hear from a representative of the new Cornell Free Speech Alliance. Very exciting for this campus to have this organization here. Steve Baginski is here, and Steve would like to tell you about the Cornell Free Speech Alliance. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Steamboat. Uh, thank you, Randy Wayne for uh, what you do and especially for sponsoring uh, this event tonight. Uh, Cornell Free Speech Alliance, uh, CFSA, uh, it's a rapidly growing, relatively new organization. It's a uh, nonpartisan, uh, but we do have 13,000 uh, followers and subscribers. These are drawn mostly from, uh, oh, I'm told, almost 300,000 living Cornell uh, alumni and we really haven't thoroughly networked our way through the alumni group, uh, so we think we're gonna have a pretty large uh, organization um, uh, fairly soon. Um, uh, what's our interest? Our interest is in more, or you might even say significantly more, uh, freedom of thought, uh, expression, and uh, especially dialogue on college campuses, and especially uh, here at Cornell. We are part of something called Alumni Free Speech Alliance, which uh, includes groups like CFSA at 15 uh, leading US uh, universities. 
Um, we also welcome, by the way, uh, the participation of faculty, staff, and students. Uh, so we're not just an alumni organization. You know, we welcome anyone with a Cornell affiliation uh, to be part of our group. Um, today, like Jennifer mentioned, there are over 1,200 people watching remotely, and there'll be even more than that, of course, that eventually watch as time goes by on the recorded version of this. Um, but the uh, 1,200 or so viewers right now are drawn in large part from Cornell FSA uh, followers, but also um, the followers of these 20 um, other uh, participating sponsors tonight. And I guess I'll follow Jennifer's lead and not read off the names of all these participating sponsors, but these are some great organizations and we appreciate uh, their support. Uh, just one last thing. Um, we have coined a phrase, uh, University Open Inquiry Forum, which you can see up on the screen here. And this is CFSA and uh, uh, like groups at other universities uh, sponsoring um, events, maybe not like this, but either presentations or debates on various topics where we feel that there is a need for uh, open discourse. Uh, the next installment of such a thing will be at MIT on April 4th. The topic is going to be DEI and MFE, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and merit, fairness, uh, and equality. That's on April 4th. Uh, and details uh, are forthcoming. Uh, thank you very much. We'll have a great debate tonight. Thank you. Okay, and now this is what you all came here for, is to hear a great debate. Let me introduce our speakers. Arguing the affirmative for tonight's, tonight's debate, and do we can we get the resolution up on the screen and show the voting? We want to remind people that they need to be uh, voting if they haven't already. Um, arguing the affirmative for tonight's debate is Robert Sokolow, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University. Dr. Sokolow earned his PhD from Harvard in theoretical high energy physics in 1964, was an assistant professor of physics at Yale from 1966 to 71, and joined the Princeton University faculty in 1971 with the assignment of inventing interdisciplinary environmental research. From 2000 to 2019, Dr. Sokolow and Steve Pakala were the co-principal investigators of Princeton's Carbon Mitigation Initiative, which was a 25-year project supported by BP. Dr. Sokolow was a member of the Grand Challenges for Engineering Committee of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy's Committees on America's Climate Choices and on America's Energy Future. He was the editor of the Annual Review of Energy and the uh, an, Annual Review of Energy and the Environment and served on the board of the National Audubon Society, uh, the Deutsche Bank Climate Change Advisory Board, and the Advisory Board of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. From 2013 to 2019, Dr. Sokolow led the Distillate Project at Princeton's Andlinger Center for Energy and the Environment, which has produced monographs on wind, on wind power, solar power, nuclear fusion, small modular nuclear fission reactors, and grid-scale storage of electricity. He also co-chaired the 2011 American Physical Society Technology Assessment, Direct Air Capture of CO2 with Chemicals. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Rob Sokolow. Come on up. Arguing the negative on tonight's resolution is Stephen Coonan. Dr. Coonan is a leader in science policy, having served as Undersecretary for Science in the U.S. Department of Energy under President Obama. In this role, he was the lead author of the department's strategic plan and the inaugural Quad Quadrennial Technology Review in 2011. With more than 200 peer-reviewed papers in the fields of physics and astrophysics, scientific computation, energy technology, and climate science, Dr. Coonan was a professor of theoretical physics at Caltech, also serving as Caltech's vice president and provost for nearly a decade. Dr. Coonan is currently a professor at New York University with appointments in the Stern School of Business, the Tandon School of Engineering, and the Department of Physics. Dr. Coonan's memberships include the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Jason Group of scientists who solve technical problems for the U.S. government. 
He is the author of Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't, and Why It Matters. And since the book's release in April of 2021, more than 200,000 copies have been sold. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Coonan. Our moderator for tonight's debate is Sarah Westwood. Sarah is a political and investigative reporter at the Washington Examiner, where she writes on a range of pressing uh, political issues. Prior to joining the Examiner, Sarah was a White House reporter for CNN, a Ro Robert Novak Journalism Fellow at the Fund for American Studies, and a graduate of the National Journalism Center Fellowship Program. And last August, we were very proud to award Sarah with uh, Steamboat Institute's 10th annual Tony Blankley Fellowship for Public Policy and American Exceptional Exceptionalism awarded to outstanding young journalists. Welcome, Sarah. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate everyone being here. As you know, by now we have Dr. Robert Sokolow and Dr. C. here tonight. Uh, I think one thing that's going to be unique about tonight's discussion is the extent to which our two debaters here agree on so much of the science and where the science should lead us policy-wise. Of course, we will also get into the areas in which they have drawn different conclusions about just how large and how rapid reductions in greenhouse gases should be. So before we get started, uh, please remember that everyone has QR codes. Please be submitting your questions throughout this. If, if anything that either of our experts says jumps out to you and you would like to get into that later in the debate, in the back half, we'll be, we'll be going to questions. So first, each debater is going to have 10 minutes to deliver an opening statement, followed by five minutes each to deliver a rebuttal to what the other said. And tonight we're going to start with Dr. Sinclair. That's my cover slide, and here we go. Um, I would like you to vote, at least in the sense of deciding which of these four quadrants you are most comfortable in by answering two yes, no questions. The first is, is our fossil fuels hard to displace? And the second is, is climate change an urgent matter? I've been showing this, pair of sl this slide for quite a while. Answers differ. I give you about 20 seconds to decide which quadrant you belong in. Okay, you're most comfortable in. Okay. Can I just see how many are in the first top left? Raise your hand. Top right? Quite a few. Bottom left? Only a handful. And bottom right? Majority. Okay, so why do I do this? Because it seems to me the core of this is that we have problems answering these two questions in a consistent fashion. The top left is pretty uninteresting, although once upon a time, I would say when I started my career, there were people who thought we would be all nuclear power by now and climate change wasn't the reason. Top right is where I think Steve is, although he can disagree. Bottom left is where a lot of the, uh, a lot of the strongest statements about how fast we should move, the advocates of those are located there. They see fossil fuels able to be swept away. And the bottom right is what I inhabit and what I believe we should be do as an accurate representation of the problem. If you're in the top right or the bottom left, you sleep better at night. There is no conflict that is under, that is driving you. And if you're hearing about the problem for the first time, you want to move to the top right or the bottom left. That's the natural place to want to be. Um, and frankly, I think that they're, they are dangerous places to be because they both essentially say, uh, we're going to be okay. Uh, but they're betting on, they're, if people follow their recommendations, they're essentially betting on a happy outcome. The military doesn't bet on happy outcomes. Businesses don't bet on happy outcomes. So I think that's a, a, a scary thing to do. Rather, I think we want to have movement toward the bottom right. And I feel as if for the rest of my career, I want to try to make that happen. An awful lot pushes in the opposite direction in both, on both arrows. 
Um, and I think the bottom right is where you get an attention to risk minimization, to uh, buying more insurance. I mean, the question really is how much insurance to buy. I think when it comes down to, it's a similar question. You can buy too much, you can buy too little. And that we could be wrong with whatever we start out with. Steve's book is uh, mostly about how we're gonna be okay, climate change is gonna be mild, but here and there, he shares my concern that there is a real, there is a chance because we don't understand the planet all that well, that we could have some pretty dangerous outcomes. And if we do, we have to be more, uh, more active. And if we think we could now, now could imagine bad outcomes, I think that means we have to work harder. So what if we, if we want to be in the right bottom, right, bottom right, we have to make some concessions to people we don't agree with, and we have to build, and my main point is we have to build alliances and build what I call middle building in general. Um, sorry, for first, uh, first this slide, I'm one slide ahead of myself. The phrase large and rapid is in the debate statement. And I made it clear that I don't mean by large and rapid what I think was presumed by the organizers and maybe by Steve, uh, because so many people do mean this. Large and rapid means uh, basically uh, pretty extreme positions of um, decarbonization, remove fossil fuels. And so I'm saying large and rapid is building a, con building a constituency that is much broader than the current one because the, depolariz the polarization at the present time is thwarting serious action. Um, and that we, rapid means that we actually go in one direction. We can go fast, but go round and round. So I'm, I'm defining, defining large and rapid for this, for this debate to mean coherent and largely and much more depolarized than at the present time. Um, I talk about what would it, so the rest of my talk is essentially how do we build uh, that bottom quadrant. And first of all, we actually have to allow, develop the mental capacity to be in the bottom quadrant, which is meaning to be adult. It's complicated. John Keats called it negative capability. You hold two ideas in your head at once, which are somewhat incompatible. The irresistible force meets the immovable object. I remember as a seven-year-old or something finding, or a 12-year-old finding that very interesting as a concept, and then gather there's a song about it now. That's what, we're, that's what it's about. And if you're an environmentalist, you, you outgrow the idea that you can demonize the, that it's productive to demonize the fossil energy world. And if you're in the fossil energy world, you realize that it's productive and useful to accept that the risks of the high tail of the dangerous outcomes need to be addressed. Uh, and aggress addressable, aggressively. Um, so I've tried to, you can build a list as well as I, of the things that we don't talk about very much that would build a consensus. And um, there's a long list on my part, but I'd start with science. It is a startling fact that with all of the attention to larger budgets to deal with climate change, there's virtually no discussion building a stronger science effort. More probes in the ocean, more studies of ice, more work on the tundra. The climate science community is healthy, but it's not growing and it's not being infused with other disciplines. I know Steve has written quite strongly in his book about the very same thing, more climate science. But I would argue, I will argue that Steve personally could be playing a bigger role. I wish he would. I'm here partly to persuade him to do that. Um, and then, and then when it comes to other aspe aspects of the problem, lots of ideas, the business community is gonna be challenged to make, to welcome inspection of the, that they're actually achieving what they say there are. There's not much trust, so you have to have a lot of th third party work uh, in, in the business progress. Uh, th there, is, there is the weaknesses of low carbon and solutions of which I'll say a few things later. 
But we really do worry about, I worry that the solutions to climate change are full of their own problems and we mustn't underestimate them, which is why I don't think we should go as fast as we possibly could. We want the fossil energy industries involved. Carbon capture and storage has fascinated me for a quarter century because it is a way in which the fossil energy industry can be constructive toward low carbon solutions. It's not very, it's, it's, it's losing popularity and it shouldn't. Uh, leapfrogging in developing countries, I'll say a little bit more about that too, but we really have a lot of focus, need to have a lot of focus, as Steve and I both agree, on what's happening in the developing countries, far more focus than we have right now. And and things like the, the industry taking responsibility for the products they make in new ways. Um, and let's let jump to the last one. It's terrible that poor people, that young people are feeling futureless. That's a word I learned quite recently. Many of them are feeling that there's something, that there's a doom ahead of them. And that is a, a, a side effect that I think is extraordinarily unfortunate of the way in which we're talking about climate change today. Um, I'm going to skip that slide. I'm going to skip that slide and come back to it and figure out just time for one more slide, although I'm not seeing where the timer is. Um, it's time to move on. My real sense is that this debate is okay, but we really have more important things to do. We have to find the ways of not debating, but working side by side, which is why I've tried to move so much myself to the middle, not just, I mean, for, that's, that's who I am. It's not just for tonight. Um, and I'm gonna tell Steve that I'm, I, I happen to have, as in, at working at Princeton, an institution next door, which is one of the leading climate modeling centers of the world, the unfortunate name, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. It models the atmosphere and the oceans and the forests. And it's a spectacular place and has some of the smartest of the young people. And they share Steve's frustration with the conversation, with the, with the I call it noun inflation, that brings about words like apocalypse and Armageddon and existential destruction and so forth. That's not good for anybody, including for the young people who start feeling doom. And we don't have to go there, but they won't follow Steve until Steve moves from which he's perfectly capable of doing. Um, and Steve moves to say, we do need action on climate change. We have so many things we can do that are useful. I was showing a list of them. Industry is now assuming that's going to be busy. It's not going to be persuaded anymore that we, we're going to slow down the government responses. So how are they going to do things? They need help. What's, what are the priorities? What are the risks of the solutions as I keep coming back to it? And um, we have to build new alliances. And one of them is the one between Steve and me. Uh, that, that, so we can generate a larger and more rapid response, wider response, not 51 votes in the Senate, but 75 over and over again, and the comparable votes in other countries. In other countries. We have to get, but this is a climate, this is a part of our human condition, is that we are overwhelming a planet that isn't very big. We're doing it with fisheries, we're doing it with timber, we're doing it in so many ways. And this ozone hole was another example. And this is one more, where one way or another, we, can't, we shouldn't assume we're gonna be lucky. We're putting, we're putting large increases of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and there's gonna be something that results in it that we're gonna care about that's gonna hurt us. Thank you. Dr. Coonan. Okay, if we could get my first chart up, that would be great. Um, let me say, uh, you know, I have known Rob for 20 years and have enormous respect for him as a scientist and thinker about climate and energy. And so I applaud his suggestion that we build a constructive middle. And I will come to that in my remarks. But this is a debate, and I first want to tell you why the proposition is a terrible idea. When you read it, it sounds great, follow the science, but the real world has to balance scientific certainties and uncertainties against the growing demand for reliable and affordable energy. 
And in that light, the proposition fails dramatically. Large and rapid reductions are unjustified, immoral, and fantastical. So I want to begin with the word compels, which, as you'll see, makes the proposition unjustified. The UN estimates that we'll see as much warming in the next 100 years as we've already seen since 1900, some 1.3 degrees Celsius. During, or perhaps despite, that prior warming, we have seen the greatest improvement ever in the human condition. Lifespan, literacy, nutrition, and economic activity all increased dramatically even as the population quintuple, quintupled, and the rate of extreme poverty plummeted from 70 to 10 percent. Significantly, today's death rate from extreme weather is 1 50th of what it was in 1900. So it beggars belief to believe that a comparable warming over the next 100 years would significantly derail that progress or even reverse it. Even though the climate varies a lot on its own, many people allege that we've broken the climate in past decades. But the IPCC says it's hard to find long-term global trends in most types of extreme weather events, including storms, droughts, and floods. So economic loss rates have actually declined slightly over the past 30 years, averaging about two-tenths of a percent of global GDP. A wealthier world is a more resilient world. Now, maybe the future will be a lot worse. But the UN projects substantial economic growth, even for an emissions-heavy future. In 2014, they said, for most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to the impacts of other drivers. Subsequent research has confirmed that warming is expected to be a minor hindrance to growth. A few degrees by the end of the century would make the growing economy a few percent smaller than it might have been. Of course, there are uncertainties in these projections. GDP is not the only measure of well-being, and the rich will fare better than the poor. But the term existential crisis is hardly justified, even by the official science. One might fret still about severe but unlikely climate impacts, the fat tails, as people say. So we hear things like, something very bad might happen. We don't know what or when or just how bad, but we'd better act. The well-to-do might clutch their pearls over that, but it's hardly compelling for most of the world, which has many more impactful, immediate, and soluble problems. And so the word us makes the proposition immoral. The one and a half billion of us in the developed world enjoy abundant and affordable energy. But the globe's other six and a half billion people are energy poor. And the inequalities are astounding. We Americans consume 30 times more energy per capita than Nigerians. And three billion of the world's eight billion people use less electricity every year than does the average US refrigerator. Energy poverty means cooking with wood and dung. Smoke in kitchens kills two million people a year around the world. And while dining by candlelight is romantic, studying by candlelight is not. Global energy demand will increase 50% by mid-century as most of the world develops. Fossil fuels are the most reliable and convenient way for developing nations to get that energy, as they long have been for everyone in the world. And so global emissions will grow in the coming decades, even as the developed world's emissions decline slowly. And remember, just to stabilize, not even reduce, warming influences to an allegedly safe level, emissions have to vanish by the latter half of this century. And that's what I mean by large and rapid. Reliable and affordable energy is the overwhelming priority for developing nations. 
And so when the proposition says science compels us, the response from the developing world is, what do you mean us? The Indian prime minister po protests that the path for development is being closed to developing nations, while the Nigerian president says Africa is being punished by Western decisions and will fight to exploit the fossil fuels it has. They're right. It is immoral for the developed world to deny the developing world the energy that they need. And it's the height of carbon colonialism to restrain development by mandating costly and ineffective energy systems if we in the developed world are not going to pay the extra costs. And I can tell you that we're not. The proposition is also immoral because continued exaggerations like science compels induce echo anxiety. Some 60% of young people globally are very worried about climate change, and many are reluctant to have children. Net zero by even 2100 would be an heroic achievement. But the world isn't facing climate catastrophe, so it's pernicious to exaggerate the importance and urgency of reducing emissions at the expense of more immediate and impactful societal needs. Finally, the fantasy of large and rapid reductions. Energy systems change slowly for fundamental reasons. Their infrastructure lasts for decades. Their parts have to work together as a system, and there are many stakeholders whose interests don't often align. It also takes time to refine the hardware and operating procedures that ensure high reliability. So large and rapid is really problematic. A zero emission electrical grid is central to decarbonization strategies. Solar panels and wind turbines are the current fashion, and they are today's cheapest ways of generating electricity. But you need a backup system for when there's no sun or wind. Technologies like natural gas with carbon capture, or nuclear, or some form of storage like giant batteries. That reliability is the costliest aspect of a renewables heavy grid. Ensuring high reliability, such as we enjoy today, would more than double the cost of electricity with current technology. But reliability is one of only many oops issues as we careen toward a renewables-heavy, all-electric world. Solar and wind need an order of magnitude more land than other technologies. They also need a lot more stuff. Wind takes 10 times more concrete and steel than nuclear. And renewables use 10 times more high-value materials like copper, molybdenum, and dysprosium. Unfortunately, those high-value materials and their processings are today concentrated in inconvenient countries. The Democratic Republic of the Congo produces 75% of the world's cobalt, while China is a major player in extracting rare earths and processing many critical materials. China also manufactures most of the world's solar panels. Their costs are lower due to cheap coal-fired energy, loose environmental standards, and forced labor. All that means a tremendous increase in mining and manufacturing as new energy technologies are deployed and an increase in their environmental impacts. Renewables will not remain the cheapest form of generation. Mineral supplies will have a hard time keeping up with large and rapid reductions. Finally, we'll have to more than double the capacity of transformers and cables to deliver extra power for vehicles and heat. In short, we'll need an expensive and disruptive remake of the entire energy system. A hard look at its cost and benefit is long overdue. So to sum up, the proposition is unjustified. There is no imminent climate catastrophe. The proposition is also immoral. We cannot condemn most of humanity to expensive and inadequate energy. And finally, the proposition is fantastical. Techno-economic realities mean that large and rapid changes in energy systems are just not going to happen. These three points warrant a sound rejection of the proposition. But even as you vote for its rejection, I suspect you're also wondering, well, Steve, what should we do?
and I'll cover that in my closing remarks. Thank you. Dr. Sacco, your rebuttal, you have five minutes. So let me say again, large and rapid compared to what? And large and rapid compared to the current impasse means coherent, consensual, aggressive, forward movement. It doesn't mean drop everything else. It could mean drop everything else. Some people do mean drop everything else, but I don't mean drop everything else. Voting for large and rapid is compared to spinning wheels uh, and being incoherent and divisive and deep and polarized and so forth. That's what my vision of large and rapid is. Um, am I still here? Am I still here with my slides? Yes. Well, but I'm going to have to go through all of them, which is okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk just about the developing countries. I've spent some time thinking about them. Of course, you all, most of you have. Uh, the first thing is, there's lots of opportunity in the developing countries. We don't want to patronize. They have new, we have new tech. We, we, well, globally, we have new technology options. It used to be that the developing countries looked at leapfrogging and said, "No thanks. Do it first in your country. After you've proved it out, we'll do it." The elites were saying that for much of the time that I've been involved in this subject, and they don't anymore. For the most part, they say, we can solve our own problems. We'll take advantage of, we can do things. And an example of the high voltage transmission lines in China is the one I have on them. Um, solar panels at very, almost zero cost has transformed the villages of the world and can continue to do so. One panel, two panels can give you uh, refrigeration and, and, and cell phone charging and, and a few lights, and it makes an enormous difference. So we don't underestimate the new, the new opportunities associated with, with um, uh, develop, developing countries. And then don't underestimate the importance of what it was called, it's called lock-in. That, that where there is new capital construction, there is determination for 50, 100 years of what kind of emissions are gonna come. So there is an enormous global interest in low carbon development to the extent that, that we want to have not just go up and up and up. And I think some of the highest growth scenarios are not impossible if we pay no attention to some of this. I wrote a paper with Steve Davis um, a few years ago called Committed Emissions, where we worked out if you build a power plant, charge all of the 50 years of operation, 40 years of operation to today and, and figure out how much, how much additional commitment is coming. And when you build buildings like this, like this office, building complex, I know that that is not a well-built system because nobody is trying to break ground relative to the norms of the construction of office buildings and multifamily housing that's been going on everywhere. We can do it so much better. We know we can. They're not, and, and, and uh, that should be, a, this is where the building, the buildings like this are being built in far greater numbers in developing countries. And there's no emphasis anywhere in the climate conversation on these buildings. I've tried them again and again to inject it. And then I, I want to make sure we don't misunderstand uh, poverty, That's because there's something important going on. This is this is the usual way in which people talk about poverty uh, in climate: the per capita emissions of countries, and and the U.S. is around 15 tons of carbon per person, carbon dioxide per person per year. The world average is about five. China went from about two to about 10. Europe and, and much of the world, a great big tail there is very poor countries. However, it isn't easy but with effort. Um, I'm gonna show you a slide that's a little bit complicated. Uh, we took the, we tried to say to the, to take the whole world population, forget about where people live, and just, but use income distributions to estimate per capita, not per capita, individual emissions. And it turns out that when you bin that, you can take this number 10, 10, take previous graph, I guess I showed the lines for 10 and two tons of carbon dioxide per person per year. And if you do it this way, there's about a billion people with this kind of emissions. Um, 
and they are all over the world, and more than half will be in the developing countries. It is rich people in developing countries which are producing these additional missions, not poor people. And so we are talking about people like ourselves, lifestyles like ours, and, and, and we are in it together, about a billion of us. They will grow in numbers, but it's, it's wealthy people in developing countries. It's not poor people in developing countries that are, whose emissions are, at, are available for, for modification at this time. But let me first deal with the um, statement that Rob made that he's not advocating large and rapid. Um, that may be, but there's a great bulk of prominent people in society who are doing just that. The UN Secretary General, the financial world, the current administration are all claiming to go to net zero or aiming to go to net zero by 2100, we're going to ban internal combustion engines in the U.S. or the sale of them by 2035. Those steps will be enormously disruptive. And as I've mentioned, there is no crisis. And even if the U.S. were to go to zero tomorrow, that's only a 13% reduction in global emissions, which would be eaten up by the growth in the rest of the world. And believe me, the rest of the world may be leapfrogging, but they're not getting very far. We've got coal consumption booming in China and India, so not much leapfrogging going on there. And even Germany, perhaps the most developed country that has made the strongest commitment to reduce its emissions, is building dozens of gas-fired plants. So I think we need, Rob, to temper strongly this precipitous rush to net zero, which will be a much greater disruptor than anything you can imagine, climate change. With respect to the developed world and what they choose to do, I, I think your discussion so far, Rob, has been a very developed world perspective. The developing countries have very certain, immediate, and soluble problems, which you're asking them to deal with in a more difficult way in favor of some vague, uncertain, and distant problems associated with climate change in the future. You know, it's a little bit like telling a starving person that you better not eat that because of the cholesterol involved. Mm -hmm. Let us deal with the immediate problems. They need energy to have a better quality of life, but also to be more resilient and capable of dealing with a changing climate. I'm not at all opposed to telling develop, or actually not telling developing countries what they should do, but we should stick with that. And if they choose to go with fossil fuels, as the economics and the technology tell them they should be doing, if they want to solve their immediate problems, we should not inhibit them from doing that. And I think that's about all I want to say Right now, we can have some extra time for discussion and questions, and I'll come back again uh, at the end saying what I think we should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kunin, uh, for that. This first question I'm going to pose first to Dr. Sokolo, but I'd like you both to sort of discuss this with us. And just a reminder to everyone in the audience, you do have your QR codes. Please continue to submit those questions. Um, the people who are typically proposed as uh, portrayed as being climate deniers sort of focus on two things, right? One of them is the uncertainty within the climate science, and the other one is the sort of economic pain that would be associated with any sort of 
effective energy transition. So my question to both of you, starting with Dr. Sokola, is what do you each think is the appropriate balance between the economic sacrifices that would need to be made? And I'm talking now about through a domestic lens here in the U.S., and we'll get to developing countries later, the balance between that and the sort of need to, to address climate change? Well, uncertainty and pain. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty, I've never understood the way the argument is made. It seems to me to go the other way, that the more we are uncertain, the more we have to be risk averse, and therefore the more insurance we need to buy. Uh, so if we, if we knew we were, we, we were going to be lucky, we would do very different things. And I hope we will actually learn the climate better fairly soon so we could reduce this risk premium that I think we feel we ought to be paying. Uh, as far as pain, even some of that goes the other way too. Uh, it's been enormously stimulating to technology to have this new challenge of climate. And the wind and solar and battery responses have been dramatic. And they have reduced the cost of many of the things we, would, we, would, we were doing before. So before I'm convinced that there are certainly things that are going to be very, very expensive and foolhardy to do, but there's a cost curve. Dr. Kunin. Well, you know, that's a, a question that uh, my first inclination is, it's above my pay grade, okay? Because in fact, I think the proper role for, for scientists is to lay out the scientific certainties and uncertainties, the likely costs, benefits, and drawbacks of different strategies, but really, in the end, the decision is societies and will involve values, priorities, culture, where you sit in the global order. And so I generally try to stay away from a normative discussion, you should do X, Y, or Z, except in this debate where I have to take some extreme position because we need to lay out for you the extremes. It is a political discussion, and we have not had that political discussion fully informed in the US. We have exaggerations by politicians, by the government, even by some in the scientific community meant to skew the balance, and we, as an electorate, should be pretty angry about that. There needs to be an informed discussion, debate about trade-offs. Dr. Kunin, talking about, I'm gonna start with you for this next one, talking about the, the alarmism that we hear in some of the, the climate change discussions, um, focusing on the rapid part of the resolution. Some climate activists and politicians that champion a climate agenda do really focus on the urgency of the need to fight climate change. And, and sometimes that sort of turns people off to the, engaging productively with the climate debate. What do you think the balance should be in terms of conveying that there could be some sort of urgent threat with climate and, and not sounding so alarmist? I, I think part of the problem with talking to the public or non-experts about climate change is that the historical record is distorted or um, corrupted. And so, for example, you might see, just to take a real example, the Pakistani environmental minister, after this summer's terrible floods in Pakistan, said, these are the worst floods since 1961. And she was right. But the scientist in me says, let's look back before 1961. And in fact, you discover that there were monsoons that were equally powerful way back to 1850. So there is that distortion of not including the full historical record. The second is the IPCC says for many severe weather phenomena, tropical cyclones, um, hailstorms, mid-latitude storms, there is no detectable trend. What concern there might be in the future is based upon models that are demonstrably unfit to project at that level of precision. Dr. Sokolow, do you have a... Yeah, again, if rapid is relative to do nothing, we can understand it. The, the environmental movement looks at that stall and says, how do we change it? And they are... They have come upon this 
uh, net zero, as, and it has, it has actually jump-started the conversation, done what they were seeking to do. Businesses which were really f putting off as somebody else's problem, a low carbon, low carbon solutions, all over the all over the industrial space, uh, are, got, have gotten serious. Have taken that somehow they get it, whether they should get it or not is another question. But they they in terms of description, they're saying this is part of our future. There will be policies which will make all kinds of new things profitable. We've got to get on top of it. We've got to understand the vocabulary and the numbers and so forth. So it if you think of net zero as jump starting rather than the, what really people are going to try to do, jumps, all the fossil energy is gone by, tw by 2050. I don't think so, but I wonder how many people who say net zero believe it, e 2050 believe it either. They know that it's got something underway. And so it is more rapid than before. Part of the crux of the debate, both of you touched on this in your opening statements, is the question of what should be required of developing countries that haven't had a chance to achieve the same economic prosperity as, as the rest of the world. To, to use an example to sort of illustrate this debate, in Uganda and, and Tanzania, there is right now a major pipeline being constructed that has proven somewhat controversial. The European Parliament has weighed in and said they don't agree that this pipeline should be built. And Uganda says this is creating thousands of jobs for our citizens who need them. So you talk about leapfrogging. We talk about this discussion that needs to be had. Do other countries have the right to tell Uganda they can't build that pipeline? Well, uh, I think some of this is done by global institutions that are financing the pipeline. So they have a right to talk about what they spend their money on. Um, even if it, it may be colonial, but it will be the, the sort of the way the institution is set up. Right. Coal power plants have, were, have been on the list of, of a very controversial category and, and with periods of time when the World Bank was against uh, financing them. Uh, on the ground that this was going backwards on climate change uh, and arguing that, and presumably needing to finance al alternatives. There is, I, I think if there, there is this, it, the issue of, of um, stranded assets, if you build some of these things and the world really does care more about, about climate change, these will get more expensive to operate. Um, I don't know the Uganda pipeline story directly, I have to say. I won't try to guess. So, so I know a little bit about the Uganda pipeline. Mm -hmm. The World Bank has said no. Um, I think that is wrong for two reasons. One is you're denying them the opportunity to exploit their natural resources. But perhaps more importantly, the World Bank says, no, fine. China's just going to step in and do it anyway. And so I think the world is going to need more oil. Even the president said, uh, we're going to need more oil for the next 10 years. Uh, he, he's wrong. We're going to need it for the next 40 or 50 years at least. And so I'm not too worried about stranded assets uh, with respect to the pipeline. But again, and I would ask Rob directly, suppose you were running India and you had all the constraints that the Indian PM has, wants to get reelected, but you cared about climate change. What would you do? Well, it's clear it's it's what's happening in India, I think, is an all the above kind of response. Uh, in fact, I think the data are clear that there's more solar built in a country that is building coal plants than one that isn't. Um, so uh, it used to be they would have no solar at all. And India is a pretty sunny country. Um, and it's, it's going to be, there are going to be land challenges uh, because it's a crowded country as well. But I think I would I would build uh, I would definitely also explore carbon capture and storage. I know that it's not obvious how that works in India because of some of the geology. But I got interested in carbon capture and storage 25 years ago because it brought the fossil energy industry into the low carbon world. It seemed to me this was a broader alliance that would be more likely to succeed than the ones that would be constructed without the fossil energy industry. So India would build a, a coal power plant and the additional 25 to 50 percent cost borne somehow, maybe by the richer countries, to capture the CO2, which either goes underground in India or even conceivably goes into a ship 
that it in, in compressed form goes across to this across the uh, Indian Ocean to the to the uh, Saudi Arabia to put in it under its into its depleted oil fields. We could have it, it's it's a cost that, that, that of a world that moves CO two around a lot, captures and moves it around a lot, keeps the fossil industry engaged. I think we haven't explored this option enough. So, so just one thing about India or China building more renewables. As you well know, new energy technologies usually do not supplant old ones, but simply add on top of them, particularly in the developing phases of countries. And so, yeah, great to have more wind and solar, not particularly reliable, but okay, but they're still going to keep burning coal and natural gas. And in fact, emissions from India and China have been going up strongly. Yeah, and they've also built, in China in particular, colossal amounts of solar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are doing it still. I mean, they obviously have a run, country run by engineers fascinated by technology and getting all kinds of stuff built and lowering the cost on them. Yeah, but on, coal is still growing strongly in China. Coal would take a long time to phase out the coal, which is why the CCS, the carbon capture and storage option for the fossil industries, I think is still important. That is a perfect segue, actually, into my next question for Dr. Kunin. It has been sort of a conservative refrain for decades now that the free market will provide the solutions to climate change, and therefore there's no need for excessive government subsidies, government intervention. You both just sort of mentioned that hasn't really happened. There ha the free market has not yet produced a technology that has inspired universal adoption or supplanted traditional energy supplies. Is that not an argument in favor of more government intervention? I, you know, the, the government intervenes in the energy system in two ways. The most, I think the way in which most people on both sides of the political spectrum in this country would agree is to do the early stage R&D, research and development of energy technologies, and to help with the demonstration of the first of a kind technologies. And the Department of Energy does that uh, with varying degrees of success. I was involved in that, whether it's small modular nuclear reactors, carbon capture and storage, the early days of solar cells and, and so on, hydrogen these days, of course, batteries, um, where, and you know, there, there is some debate about exactly how far the government should go into deployment of things, stimulating deployment. But by and large, I think most people agree, research and development demonstration is an appropriate role for the government. The other way in which the government intervenes is by setting standards, mandates, and so on. If it really wants to reduce carbon emissions, it needs to set a predictable price on carbon, whether it's through tax or cap and trade, we can have a discussion, uh, and stick with that over some number of decades, because that's how long it takes the energy system to change. And we have not been able to do that in this country. And again, even in Europe, where there's a greater commitment, there's backsliding in the case of, uh, say, Germany and gas-fired plants, or the UK and, and gas or nuclear. So um, it, the energy timescales are a decade or more, the political timescales of two years or four years, and there's just a mismatch. Right. I find it hard to, I mean, Economics 101 teaches you that the free market does not solve problems which are unpriced, and that the that the carbon dioxide, the climate problem is a problem that is not in the, in the price system until you put it there, and you put it there with public policy. It will never be cheaper to put CO2 in the ground than vent it. And you know, if you're going to promote the idea that CO2 could go underground after you've captured it, you're going to have to put a price for the person who does it that pays for it. So free market cannot solve by itself a problem uh, where, which is which is called an externality in the economics literature. That's what we have government for. How much we should spend on it depends on how much we think it is a damaging externality. And the price of carbon uh, is is a is a substitute for that. If it really weren't very important, 
$10 a ton of carbon dioxide would, and lots of things wouldn't happen. If it's very important, $100 a ton. And then lots of additional things do happen. My last question before we start taking questions from our audience, you know, so much of the public conversation around climate science, um, especially in the political sphere for years has been focused on raising awareness of the climate challenge. But I think you both have acknowledged that a lot of the climate conversation in the public sphere has become unproductive. At this point, do you think the, the Greta Thunbergs of the world, are they counterproductive? I'm sorry, the who of the world? Greta Thunberg, she's a, she's a very young right, right. climate activist. Are they starting to become counterproductive to the climate change debate? Okay, so the, what I think Greta Thunberg has done is make more vivid the concept of future generations. For a very long time, the climate change d discussion among people who really cared about it was about future generations, and they were abstract people. They were 50 to 100, they were, they were 100 years out, or they were 50 years out, but you were 75 and you didn't know anybody in that who was gonna be, you weren't gonna be alive then. Greta Thunberg said, this is, she said, how dare you take this away from us? And you were, Steve and me, and most of you in here. So she changed the conversation, and the young people picked up on it, said, no, you're, it is actually intergenerational for people alive today. For better or for worse, the conversation is new, and I give her considerable credit for making that happen. And it's harder to look at the college freshmen or sophomore, there aren't as many students in here as I hope there would be, but some of you, you can speak up. It's your future that you feel as if we are compromising. And once that's the conversation, it's more normative, and I think it's more powerful. I think the public, at least in the developed world, the US, the EU, Japan, and so on, uh, have gotten a bit numb to um, claims of future catastrophe um, because it just hasn't happened. You can go back to Al Gore in the 90s. I, I just read that Greta just deleted a tweet that she made in 2018 saying the world would end this year unless we got off of fossil fuels. So the public, I think, is smarter than that. The young people need to be educated. When I talk to the undergraduates at NYU or other places, talk about the science and the facts uh, they come away with a very different impression than they uh, come in with. So I've got a fair bit of faith in the sensibilities of young people. So we'll start with our audience questions now. Uh, here's one for, for each of you. Dr. Sokolow, you can start if you'd like. Do you think it is important to distinguish between these two statements? Human activity causes global warming and climate change or human activity contributes to global warming and climate change? So if there were no human activity, would the planet get, be getting warmer right now? Is one way to take that question. And I don't think we know. Um, Steve has emphasizes that there is a lot of natural variability and we could be in a warming period for reasons that related to the deeper uh, uh, ocean and atmospheric currents don't think it's very likely. My guess is we would not be warming. And so the, the warming would be nearly entirely due to our activity. But the shorter the time period, the less you can be confident of that. The, the way I like to answer that question is that humans are exerting a warming influence on the climate, and the climate responds to that influence. But there are other influences, both external, solar activity, human, and uh, natural influences, natural variability associated with changes in the deep ocean that also influence the climate and to which it responds. And that could be cooling the planet. Right. And, and in fact, it's not so easy to disentangle them. That's one of the main challenges in climate science is to disentangle the response to human influences from the response to other influences, including natural variability. But we actually have no reason to think that we that the natural variability is warming the planet. It's as far as I know, we are completely ignorant. Well, it, well, although you know, we have exactly. for example coming out of the Little Ice Age, coming out of the Ice Age century, the planet did warm. Yes, and the planet did cool before that, and then warm again. So there are natural changes on a century or two time scale. The issue is the recent warming 
uh, people will say, is more rapid than we have seen uh, due to natural influences of the past. Right, fair enough. And that's one of the arguments. Dr. Kinnan, this next one, we can start with you. When assessing the efficiency of renewable energy sources, proponents often fail to include in calculations the enormous energy input, like sourcing and production, needed to manufacture and later recycle components, such as solar cells, turbine blades, and so on. Should this be a larger part of the conversation in terms of their contributions to climate change? So, so this is under the guise of energy return on investment, or EROI. I think for solar cells, uh, they will pay back themselves in some number of years. I'm not too worried about that. But the broader question is, you know, it's not the amount of energy, it's the kind of energy. So to give you an example, we routinely burn coal or gas, throw away a half or two thirds of the thermal energy to make electricity. And we do that we intentionally waste the energy, we prefer not to, but we do, because we want the electrical energy rather than the thermal energy. The electrical energy's got lots of wonderful qualities that we want. And so I'm not too concerned about the fact that we might be turning uh, coal into wind turbines and do that inefficiently, because we want the electricity rather than the thermal energy from the coal. I think this is an, we do need to keep track of net carbon, net energy, net dollars. And we, price mechanisms do some of that. But um, one of the ones I'm concerned about is there's been a fascination with two out of the atmosphere. Uh, while we have a fossil energy system, and if we use fossil energy to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, we will actually go backwards. We will put more CO2 into the atmosphere than we'll take out for most of the capture systems that I'm, air capture systems I'm aware of. And so they implicitly Im require a decarbonized energy system to make any sense, in which case they're not, which shouldn't be on the, uh, expect, expected to expand at this, at this stage of the global economy. The, you know, the same, argument is true to some extent for carbon sequestration. Uh, the world, most of the carbon dioxide that the world uses now is used for enhanced oil recovery. And so you put the carbon dioxide in the ground in the hope that you're gonna push more carbon in the form of the oil out of the ground. And it's a net win in terms of emissions if you push out less carbon than you put in. But in fact, the people doing this hope that they're gonna push out more carbon, and at least in some fields, you get twice as much carbon out as you're pushed into the ground. So it's subtle and it depends on the details. Yes, it's presumably a stepping stone to a different kind of carbon capture and storage where there is no longer yeah. major oil production at the same time. So will probably be the last question that we have time for, but I think it's a good one to end on. It's about trust in the scientific community and how it's trust been, in the scientific community and how it's been eroded dire predictions from climate change models are the primary impetus for reducing fossil fuels yet these models are developed with sometimes the same methodology and by the same types of people who brought forward covid models those models ultimately failed they missed on hospitalization levels and deaths despite being a vastly simpler problem with better known variables. So why should people trust climate models? Oh Lord. <laughs> I'm alive because of the science that was done in the last five years. And so are probably some of you. We have had the vaccines that have saved so many people's lives. And they came because we had warp speed. I wish people would get more credit who put it in place. And the idea that COVID is a story, that, of anti-science story, really just makes me angry. Uh, we have lost trust in, I don't know where this comes from, why it wasn't regarded as a triumph of science that we have the vaccines that we have. Uh, so the idea that we've somehow misled people, it was a murky story. This curve, COVID arose, and there was a question of whether it can be spread by, uh, by, touch, by touching surfaces or by through the air. And of course, it was through the air. And there was, there's a whole story there about the history of public health. We, and it wasn't brilliant, but overall, it was a human, a human response to a very complicated problem. Overall, the science came through. And, and the quality of the science in the climate change world is very high. 
It's very high. One of the things I respect about Steve's book is that he has never gone after the scientists and said you're you're corrupt or you're 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 you're, you're sloppy. They aren't. Some of the people who have been anti action on climate change have attacked the scientists, and that's been a terrible thing. Science is all we've got to solve the major problems of the world. It's a privileged way of knowing. We have to keep defending it. If anybody goes after it in politics, they need to be voted out. Um, I, I think, let me deal with the COVID issue first. You, you know, there are two sides to that. The, the biochemistry, the medicine, I agree with Rob, first class. And the world is much better off for the 30 or 40 years of investment in modern biotechnology that let us develop the vaccines as rapidly as we did. That said, the epidemiological models had real problems with them, and the politicians perhaps trusted them too much. You know, there's a famous statement by George Box, who was a statistician, I think, in Michigan. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And the models give us just a very fuzzy, hazy picture of what's going to happen. Uh, I sympathize with the politicians who had to make decisions about uh, the practical aspects of lockdowns and so on. The climate problem, to turn to that now, why should we trust those models, is even harder, I would submit, than the epidemiological model. We're looking for small changes, the response to physically small influences over many decades. We have pretty poor data compared to the precision we're trying to achieve. Uh, the oceans are a very important part, and we don't have very good data at all about the oceans. The system is chaotic, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the modelers are doing about as well as one can, but one should not minimize at all the difficulties or the uncertainties in their results. All right, Dr. Coonan, it's time for you to begin your five minute closing statement followed by Dr. Sokolow. And if you all, as you listen to these closing debates could vote in the post debate poll after both are done speaking, we'll go ahead and we'll put those results. I, I hope we can pull up my last slide if you, you could. Okay, nope. Maybe it's, maybe it's the one before that. Yeah, here we go. Okay, good. So I hope I've made my case against the proposition that a dispassionate look at the trends in demographics, development, energy technology shows that global net zero by 2050 is a fantasy and it's quite unlikely even by 2100. But also that the consequences of missing that goal will not be catastrophic. That doesn't mean that the world or we in the US shouldn't do anything. Here's what I think we should do. First, we have to sustain and improve climate science, for our knowledge is not what it should be. Paleoclimate studies tell us how and why the climate changed in the past. Current observations with improved courage, coverage, precision, and continuity will tell us what the climate system is doing today, and models give a sense of what it might happen in the future. There's a particular need for greater statistical rigor in the analyses and for more focused modeling efforts to reduce uncertainties. Second, we have to improve communications to the public. We need to cancel the climate crisis, even as we acknowledge that human influences on the climate are growing and we should be working to reduce them. The public must have an accurate view of both climate and energy that gets beyond slogans like, we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. I didn't make that up. That's what the Secretary General of the UN said a few months ago. Non-experts, I think, are savvy enough to dismiss unsupported scare stories, and credibility will erode, erode the more that we tell those stories. Third, we have to acknowledge that energy reliability and affordability take precedence over emissions reductions. A good start is the president's recent admission that oil and gas will be necessary in the US for at least a decade. Actually, it's gonna be a lot longer than that. 
Europe's current energy crisis is self-inflicted. Fossil fuel investments in domestic production were abandoned in favor of unreliable import partners and unreliable wind and solar generation. It was easy to see, and many people saw it and said it, that this would lead to trouble. But mitigation, reducing emissions, was deemed more important than reliability and affordability. Fourth, governments have to embark on thoughtful and graceful decarbonization programs that incorporate technology, economics, regulation behavior with estimates of cost, time scales, and actual impacts on the climate. I've already talked about R&D. My favorites for R&D are small fission reactors, grid scale storage, grid management, non-carbon chemical fuels, and carbon capture and, my, and storage should be on the list today. But programs that go beyond R&D to meaningful deployment should not be scattershot mandates and the incentives that are currently in vogue. Energy is delivered by complex systems that touch, to borrow a movie title, everything, everywhere, all the time. As I've explained, those systems are recalcitrant for fundamental reasons. And so they're best changed slowly, like orthodontia rather than tooth extraction. And precipitous climate action is far more disruptive than any plausible impact of climate change. Fifth, developed countries have to acknowledge inevitability, if not the desirability, of meeting the developing world's energy needs. Most of the world today is energy starved, and fossil fuels today provide 80% of the world's energy generation now, as they have for the past many decades. I've asked many advocates of rapid global decarbonization what they would do to meet the developing world's energy needs, and I've yet to hear a satisfactory answer. In light of all of this, there needs to be a greater focus on alternative strategies for dealing with a changing climate. Most important is adaptation. Adaptation is autonomous, it's what we humans do, and it's effective, so governments need to work to facilitate adaptation. To close, I've shown you that large and rapid reductions are an overkill. They risk far more damage to humanity than any conceivable impact from climate change. But there is also a sensible path forward that will moderate human influences on the climate while simultaneously responding to the growing demand for reliable and affordable energy. Thank you. Okay. I wrote a slide today for this as I was listening to um, who's back here. Could, will, should. Steve's got a very interesting few pages in which he talks about these three words. Um, and I'm trying to understand why Steve's book has been so polarizing rather than consensus building. And I'm afraid it's about these words. Um, because Steve says most of my interest is in could, the technologies that can happen that don't violate the laws of physics, the, the frontiers that would have to be uh, traversed in order to make them happen. But he fears into will, and would probably will. And the probably will statements are all defeatist. They are, they will, and for example, that they will probably not, they will probably not be aggressive mitigation. We're gonna probably have rising carbon dioxide and, and, and impacts that are tolerable. And people say, well, why are you saying that? It doesn't follow, it isn't science, it is guess. And most of us wanna make room for probably, possibly could and truly should. Um, and, when I think about that, I've got an awful lot of negative probabilities in my head, but they don't lead me where this goes. I'm afraid we probably could have regional nuclear war before the end of the century, that we probably are going to continue to build stupid downtowns in the, all over the world with glass, glass uh, skyscrapers, and that we probably are going to, in, both in two areas of the developing world, ravage the natural environment, Brazil and... and uh, the Congo, 
What are the chances that we'll actually do that well? I don't think they're that high. But that doesn't lead me to a message which was, is in Steve's book, which amounts to wait, no more before you act. And it'll be okay. That's not the way Steve or I look at any real problems. I don't know why he wrote it that way. Because we do want to get involved. We want to change the probabilities. We want to do something in our own lifetimes that make these things less probable. And that's what, we, that's what gets us going. That's what builds momentum. That's what makes large and rapid mean compared to stagnation. Um, we don't want to sit back. And why encourage others? Because they read it as encouraging the, th the upper right court. We can take this and we can wait a while. No big deal. It is a big deal, and people want to do something. So the negativity that is an undercurrent of Steve's remarks is in the way of our getting somewhere on this problem. Steve, put it aside. You've made that point. Start being more positive. It's time. It's really time. Well, you, you know, I let me say one more thing. There are two adjectives that Steve, two, two um, uh, verbs that Steve has in his slide, and they're fascinating. One is um, formulate, and the other is demonstrate. They're not, they're, they're one half way to do. Formulate, you know, I can formulate, but I don't do anything. I can demonstrate, but I'm not really deploying. So why are you holding back on saying stronger words than that? Because if you act without thinking, you can break the energy system. And if there's anything that is essential to a functioning society, it's reliable and affordable energy. And look at what happened in California, or is happening as the state does more and more renewable energy without reliable backups. Right? Or look at what happened in Texas, where for other reasons, uh, again, perhaps concentrating too much on wind, they forgot about reliable. Yeah, but you experiment. I mean, of all people, you know this. You experiment, you make mistakes, you get better at it, you keep going. Weight is not the same as experiment. It isn't the same as formulate and demonstrate. It, and, you know, it's not going to get solved by us anyway. This problem is really in the developing world. And you've got to encourage them to experiment. And Absolutely. You know, they don't have the capacity to do that. I had a slide which I could show too, which is very short, the end of the, that one. I'm, I'm completely yeah. with Steve about the developing countries. I think I'll say it more strongly. If they don't think climate change is important, if 50 years from now, the dialogue in India and China and Nigeria is that Brazil, is that you know, this isn't worth paying money for. We will have a lot of climate change. So it depends on how they think about the risk to themselves, to the global markets that they're part of, uh, more than it does what we think. And I agree with that. And we can help, we can nudge, it's a very useful word that's been, become more popular, and we can pay some of the cost, and we can develop alternatives that are globally useful, because the people, were, the, the, tech, the people in the poor countries that are emitting CO2 are living like us. So things that work for us will work for them in addition to some of the solutions that are specific to them. So let's get on with it. Okay, if we could get our pre-debate results. And if you haven't voted in the debate poll, text that same number really, really quick. This is what everyone's perspectives were prior to the debate. We should have post debate poll now. It's a little bit of movement. Mm. Um, still going. Um, but it was a great discussion, very productive, clearly. Changed some minds here this evening. So Dr. Sokolow, Dr. Kunin, thank you both so much for participating in our debate this evening. Good.
Thank you again to our panelists. If you enjoyed tonight's debate, we hope you'll consider supporting the Steamboat Institute and the Cornell Free Speech Alliance. Um, we have a reception for all of you who are here this evening, so if you'd like to stick around and visit with our speakers, um, enjoy the reception, you're most welcome to join us. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.